Welcome back to another Oviedo tutorial. Today I'll be showing you how to use a few of the built-in Oviedo analysis modifiers, particularly for studying the crystal structure in metals. So we'll be looking at the center symmetry parameter, we'll be looking at uh, polyhedral template matching, as well as common neighbor analysis. Along the way we'll also look at some basic uh, visualization modifiers as well that can just help you visualize any number of uh, simulations that you may be doing. So with that, let's hop right over into Oviedo. So first of all, we're going to look at the common neighbor analysis. To do this, uh, I've created a couple of example files and I'll just load one up here for you. So what you see here is essentially one FCC atom with all of its neighbors. So it's sort of like a unit cell, but not, not quite. Um, but basically, this, this atom here in the middle has all 12 of its nearest neighbors that it would need, that it would have in a typical um, FCC structure. So now what we're going to do is actually add a center symmetry parameter modifier to this scene so we can look at what the center symmetry parameter is for all of these atoms. So under add modification, go down and it should be the fourth uh, entry on the list and you should see center symmetry parameter. Now you'll notice nothing actually happened. So the next thing we actually have to do is visualize this center symmetry parameter. And we can do that with a color coding. So under here, under coloring, you can select color coding. Now you can see that you have uh, colors assigned to the atoms based on their center symmetry. So let's take a look at what we see here. You see this middle one, when I mouse over it, you can see down here in the lower left hand corner, as I mouse over it, you can see that it gives you a value for uh, all of the per atom properties actually. So the only per atom properties that I have in this scene are the identifier, which you have to have, and the position, which you also have to have, and center symmetry, which we just added just now. So you can see that the center symmetry is zero. Now a center symmetry of zero actually represents being in a perfect crystal state. So that means essentially that all of its neighbors are exactly where they should be. And more particularly, it means that there's a neighbor opposite each other neighbor. So if you look along this line, you can see that it has a nearest neighbor right here. Let me switch over to the uh, utilities tab here, and you can do something called inspect particles. That'll help you select them and kind of look at their properties more in general. So I can click one and I can control click to select more than one. So as I was saying, you can see it has a nearest neighbor on this side, and then directly opposite that, on the other side, it has another nearest neighbor. <coughs> now the center symmetry parameter means that these two neighbors are the same distance apart. So basically it's saying it's symmetric with respect to each of its nearest neighbors. For every nearest neighbor, there's an opposite nearest neighbor, the same distance on the other side. So you can see, no matter which line you look across, there's always two nearest neighbors opposite each other. If you look down any line. So that's, that's what a center symmetric structure is. And so the center symmetry parameter is saying that, uh, it's, it's saying that these are like, it's saying that the neighbors are all in the right position. If this atom here were to move a little bit, then it wouldn't be the exact opposite of this one, and so this would not have a center symmetry parameter of zero. So we can actually look at the center symmetry parameter of, say, these outside atoms, and we can see that they're very large, and that's because they don't actually have their nearest neighbors, so, or the nearest neighbors in the right spot. Look at the, this one's nearest neighbors. It needs 12 of them in an FCC structure, and all 12 are in, on this side because these are the only 12 other atoms in this you know, whole system. So that means it's very much weighted to this side, which means it has a very high center symmetry parameter, as you can see, 78 something. So that's a very high center symmetry parameter. 
Now there's one other thing that you should note about the center symmetry parameter. It actually does not, it, it does not respond to an isotropic deformation. Let me give you an example. So we're going to add something called an affine transformation. And basically, we're going to change this system um, with this transformation. So we can actually deform the system this way. We're going to move it to the beginning. So this is the beginning. So that means that this will happen before it calculates the center symmetry parameter. So look what happens. If we do, if we even just scale it in one direction, then you can see that center symmetry parameter is still zero. And that's because you can still look along any line and you still have the atoms opposite each other. So the center symmetry parameter is not very good for just, uh, for just looking at any strains, you know, any fairly uniform strains. Although, as you can see, this isn't exactly uniform. It's still uh, skewed in the x direction. But it's not good at picking that up because the only thing it sees is whether atoms on either side are displaced from where they should be. They're a different distance than the one opposite them. So you can see that that's, um, that's something you have to be aware of when you're using the center symmetry parameter. Now one other thing about the center symmetry parameter is you need to know what structure you're looking at first. So if you click on the center symmetry parameter in the modifications, you can see that it has 12 neighbors. And that's how many, na that's how many nearest neighbors an FCC lattice has. You can see it says that right here. Uh, a BCC lattice, on the other hand, has eight. The last thing I want to show you is an HCP structure. So the thing about HCP is that it's actually not a centrosymmetric structure. So you can see you have a couple lines where you have opposite nearest neighbors here. But as soon as you go outside this, the uh, close packed plane, you can see that these aren't lined up. So this one is not, this atom here is not opposite that one. And so that adds some central symmetry. And the same if you look around here, all these atoms are not lined up. So HCP is not a centrosymmetric structure, which means that uh, this should actually be 12. There's 12 nearest neighbors in HCP, but you can still see the center symmetry is not zero. But what this means is that you can't really use center symmetry when you're looking at HCP structures because it doesn't give you a very good idea of, because it doesn't know, like there's no baseline it doesn't know what a perfect crystal structure is. You can see it's nine, which is actually quite high if you're looking at any uh, any other system. So it's hard to use the, the center symmetry with any meaning when you start looking at HCP systems, at least under the definition here in Oviedo. So that's all the center symmetry stuff I want to look at. Um, we're going to load up a new file, and we're going to take a look at some uh, some different ways of looking at the crystal structure. So, oops, not that one. There we go. We're going to load in this one here. So this is just a simple, uh, simple and very small simulation I did looking at uh, FCC and BCC copper just to see like how they would, you know, start to start to transform. So I initially set them up as just half FCC and half BCC and then I added some temperature and I wanted to see you know how it would start shaking up and I imagined that this would start transforming into FCC since copper is an FCC material and is not very stable at BCC. So um, first thing we need to uh, enable the time series here because this is all in a single file and then uh, what we want to do is actually look at the the crystal structure. So first we'll use the common neighbor analysis. And we're going to move this to the end so that it's after the color coding so that you can actually see what's going on. 
So here you can see the results of the common neighbor analysis. The common neighbor analysis actually automatically uh, color maps to the scene. So you don't have to do anything else there if you don't want to. Um, and you can see the green represents the FCC right here. And the blue represents the BCC. And if we had any HCP or uh, anything else, it would actually show up as well. But you can see uh, this stuff around the edge is just marked as other because it's either, you know, it, it's not in a defined state based on the neighbors of that atom. So if we uh, scroll along here, you can start to see you get random FCC and some random HCP atoms inside the BCC phase because it's just not stable and so it's shaking up a lot. Now it turns out I didn't let this one run long enough to actually really start turning into FCC, but you get the idea that it, it would start start to transform. So you can see that this is a decent way of looking at different crystal structures, but there's another one that I actually prefer, and that is the polyhedral template matching. And this one is actually much more powerful, and it actually gives a little bit... So we'll just compare here. You can see that the common neighbor analysis gives you a lot of others. So it, does, it just doesn't try to classify a lot of these. If you look at the polyhedral template matching, it classifies a lot more. Now, that does mean that the ones that it classifies are, you know, maybe not in a very BCC structure, for example, since if you look at this atom here, uh, spec particles, if we look at this atom here, it's classified as BCC when we're using uh, our polyhedral template matching but if we look at if we look at it in the if we look at it with a common neighbor analysis we can see that it's classified as other so that's just something to keep in mind depending on which one you're using polyhedral template matching will give you a lot less other classifications but it'll give you a lot of other random ones that may or may not have a lot of meaning but I like to use it because it also gives you a lot more information so for example, we can look at this and we can also get uh, the lattice orientation or the elastic deformation gradient or an alloy type if you're using two materials or something like that. And you get a cool uh, histogram of how far apart your atoms are, so the root mean squared distance. So that's all, that's all pretty helpful. Um, and actually, I'm going to open up one more and give you an idea of the of the grain orientation. So you can see this one is a a multi-grain simulation. You can see all these pockets of FCC. These are different grains essentially in a copper material. And then all this random stuff in the middle is basically grain boundaries. Um, it's pretty uh, pretty small grained, which means the grain boundaries are large and you know very wild looking but what we can look at is if we go to our polyhedral template matching I'm gonna turn that one off if we go up to here and we enable the lattice orientation now that's enabled it's calculated the lattice orientation for all of these different atoms essentially it calculates it per atom so then what you can do I'm gonna take this color coding modifier and move it after the polyhedral template matching and then I'm going to select the property you can see there's orientation X Y Z and W so basically what this is is a quaternion so you could use this quaternion and you could convert it into a rotation matrix if you wanted but basically this is telling you the orientation of each of your atoms so if you look at that you can actually see how if you know you have the light yellows that are rotated quite a bit and then these more greener ones are rotated less um, and you could actually maybe bump this up so you can get more uh, definition you can see them distinct a bit more so this is a good way of kind of getting an idea and even calculating quantifying if you wanted to uh, the different orientations that you might have in your system so 
with that, I'm actually going to wrap this video up. I hope you found this helpful. Um, keep asking good questions, and I will see you next time in the next Oviedo tutorial video. Thanks.